Today, we're taking a look at the Volti V11. This was a single-engine light bomber, or attack aircraft, that started life as a commercial airliner, albeit a rather small one. When the Detroit Aircraft Corporation was forced into receivership in 1931, Gerard Volti, together with Vance Breeze, left to try and find financial backing for a six-passenger transport aircraft. Volti had been the chief engineer for Lockheed, who was taken over by Detroit Aircraft in 1929. He was responsible for many of the improvements made to the Lockheed Vega transports, and along with Jack Northrup, he designed the Sirius, which was used for a series of extensive long-distance flights to plot out new commercial air routes. Volti eventually found backing in the form of Eret Cord. Originally, the plan was to produce a new transport for the Cord Corporation, which itself operated two airliners. Century Airliners in Chicago, and Century Pacific Lines in San Francisco. Cord founded the Airplane Development Corporation, or ADC, in January 1932, and Volti was appointed as his chief designer. A few months later, in April, he began work on his new aircraft, and it received the internal designation of V-1. All of Volti's experience was poured into this new aircraft, which would become known as the Volti V-1 later on, and for the time of its design, it was considerably advanced. The airframe was of all-metal construction, with a true monocoque design featuring all the latest structural and aerodynamic advances. It had a powered, fully retractable undercarriage, a control suite featuring the newest electrical and radio equipment available, and a forward-sloping cockpit canopy to help reduce the glare at night. With capacity to seat eight passengers, it was predicted to be a comfortable and fast transport, one ideally suited for the local air routes. Speed was its most attractive feature, with a predicted top speed in excess of 230 miles an hour at 4,000 feet. The power to achieve this was provided by a 650 horsepower Wright Cyclone engine, and it was in this configuration that the V1 prototype first flew in February of 1933. Unfortunately, things went wrong for the V1 rather quickly. Firstly, Errant Cord had sold off his two airlines due to labour disputes, which meant that the V1 now had no guaranteed customer ready to buy it. Secondly, and more importantly, incoming changes to commercial transport standards and legislation would ultimately lead to the aircraft's doom. Safety standards were going through a period of rapid improvement, and by improvement, I mean countries were now imposing the bare minimum of what we would consider to be safety standards today. For example, until this point in time in the United States, there was no minimum crew requirement for passenger aircraft. Then, somebody sensibly pointed out that if the sole pilot of a small airliner had a medical episode or was otherwise incapacitated, it might not be a particularly good situation to be in. Thus, the ruling was made to have a minimum of a two-person crew, and the V-1 had to go back for modifications to its cockpit to allow seating for a co-pilot. During its time back at the workshop, the V-1's fortunes briefly improved when Errant Cord acquired a majority share in the Aviation Corporation, which included America Airways. This gave the V-1 a new future operator in the commercial sector, and the company placed an order for 20 improved versions as the V-1A. In July 1934, the V-1 entered passenger service for the first time, commencing flights on the Fort Worth Chicago air route. It performed its duties well, with positive remarks from passengers on its comfort, and although some pilots felt its landing speed was a little high, it was overall received favourably. Unfortunately, its small size made it uneconomic for mass production, however there were hopes that it could fill the niche of smaller air and mail routes with relative ease. Then, just three months later, it was dealt a death blow. The decision was made that single-engine aircraft would no longer be allowed to fly scheduled airline flights except during daylight hours. This was part of a push towards multi-engine designs on the ground of improved safety. Now this pretty much killed demand for the V-1 overnight, and only a few more would be completed. These would all be used as executive transports, and a few would actually find their way across the Atlantic to service transports during the Spanish Civil War. 
but for the most part, the V1 was now useless, and this left Volti in a bit of a pickle. That being said, he was determined not to let the design go to complete loss, and if the V1 would find no use in the civil market of the United States, he turned his eyes towards the military. In late 1934, Volti developed an attacker slash light bomber based on the design of the V1, and he submitted his proposal to the US Army Air Corps. The wing, undercarriage, and tail services of the original V1 were joined to a new fuselage section to produce the V11. Powered by a 750 horsepower Wright Cyclone, the SR1820 F53 version, driving a two-blade variable pitch propeller, the V1 prototype featured two tandem seats under a four-section canopy. The aircraft was easily identified by the unusual arrangement of the tail surfaces, with the horizontal stabiliser located well ahead of the tail fin. As it was designed more as a light attack aircraft, the offensive capabilities of the V-11 were fairly modest. Provision was made for an aft firing 30 caliber machine gun for defence, and then one in each wing sighted by the pilot using a telescope sight for offence. The prototype was designed to carry a 1,100 pound bomb load that could be mounted internally or externally, depending on the ordnance used. First flown on the 17th of September 1935, the first V-11 got off to a rough start. Following a successful first test flight, it crashed the following day on takeoff for its second flight at Mines Field in Los Angeles, killing test pilot T.C. Van Stone and project engineer Dugald L. Blue. However, a second prototype was already being built, and it was soon ready by the 9th of October. Designated as the V-11A, it differed slightly by having a three-blade propeller and a ring and bead sight in place of the telescopic one. Though Volti had developed the V-11 with the Army Air Corps in mind, the first operator of the aircraft would turn out to be China. As the second prototype went through its evaluation trials, it received growing interest from observers from the Chinese nationalist government, and an order for 30 aircraft was eventually placed that year. The first was completed in December 1936, and the rest were shipped between July 1937 and April of 1938. All but the first were shipped without engines, and they were assembled at either Shanghai or Tangao. The engines, which were the 850 horsepower R1820-62 version of the Cyclone, were purchased separately, and this resulted in the aircraft being designated as the V-11G. The details of the V-11 in Chinese service are somewhat sparse, though I hope to touch on it a bit more in a future video that covers the aerial element of the Second Sino-Japanese War. From what I could find, it appears they may have flown with two different air units. Most sources state that they flew with the 14th Squadron at Hangzhou, which contained a mix of volunteer American and French pilots with Chinese gunners, but others allude to them also being used by the 10th Light Bomber Squadron as well, though I'll have to do some more digging to confirm this. Basically, it appears that the V-11's service in China was relatively brief, though it certainly saw combat, and from the few translated sources I have gone through so far, it looks like it even managed to score some aerial kills as well. But as I said, more on that topic in another video. Back in the United States, the V-11GB was the next variant to be developed. This had a third crew member in the lower aft fuselage who acted as a bomb aimer or camera operator in the prone position, and also as a second gunner with a rear-facing ventral mounted machine gun. The wing armament was increased to four 30 caliber machine guns, which appears to have been done to improve its effectiveness in strafing missions rather than suggesting the V-11 be used for extensive aerial combat. Four of these new models were acquired by the Soviet Union, along with a license to manufacture the GB variant domestically. The first was flown on the 31st of January 1937, followed by another in February. These were flown with the G2 variant of the R1820, but the other two aircraft were delivered without engines and mostly used for parts. Locally, at least 31 were built in the Soviet Union as the BSH-1 with the 920 horsepower M62 engine, which was a license-built version of the Cyclone. One of the main differences from the Chinese model was the inclusion of better armour plate protection for the pilots. 
Now this improved survivability, but the increase in weight compromised performance to such a degree that the aircraft was actually rejected by the VVS. Following this, most were turned over to Aeroflot in 1939 and redesignated as the PS-43. In this guise, they would spend the next two years flying mail routes until the German invasion, after which they were then requisitioned by the VVS again and flown as liaison aircraft. Though it had little success with the Soviets, the V-11's use with foreign powers was not quite over. Volti retained one of the V-11GBs as a demonstrator for a proposed tour of Europe in 1937. Unfortunately, this never eventuated, but this disappointment was offset by new interest from Turkey and Brazil. Turkey placed an order for 40 V-11GBTs. These were delivered between September 1937 and April 1938 to the 2nd Regiment at Diyarbakir, and it appears that the demonstrator aircraft went to Turkey as well. The Turkish order was quickly followed by 26 V-11GB2s for Brazil, which was completed between June 1938 and March 1939. Interest was also expressed in a float plane version of the V-11, which made sense given Brazil's fast coastline. Unfortunately, the seaplane demonstrator, which was a hastily converted version of the last Brazilian model, suffered in storage and transport, and it arrived with rust. The Brazilian Navy thus rejected this model, and although two more seaplanes were built as demonstrators for both Brazil and the Netherlands, with the latter proposed to carry torpedoes as well, no further orders would eventuate. Ironically, for a US design that saw most of its use in foreign service, the last customer for the V-11 would actually be the US Army Air Corps. On the 24th of June 1938, the Air Corps ordered seven V-11GBs as service test aircraft, as they were considering the possibility of a larger production order. This was partly a reflection of the deteriorating political situation in Europe, and partly because of the equally deteriorating diplomatic relationship with Japan, which made the US Army realise its air units were woefully under-equipped if it were to soon find itself at war, thus the renewed interest in the design from Volti. Now, admittedly, the Air Corps was only looking at Volti's design as a backup option, as they considerably favoured twin-engine attack aircraft instead, but they didn't want to put all their eggs in one basket. Designated as the YA-19, the first was flown on the 27th of January 1939. They were powered by a new engine, the 1200 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R1830-17 Twin Wasp. Armament was increased to six 30 calibre machine guns, but the bomb load remained at 1100 pounds. Five more YA-19s were delivered during the summer of 1939, but the seventh aircraft from the order would instead be delivered as the XA-19A. This was an experimental model fitted with the Lycoming 01230-1, a liquid-cooled 12-cylinder engine that produced 1,200 horsepower. This configuration didn't last for particularly long, and it was subsequently re-engined with a Pratt & Whitney R1830-51 and renamed to the XA-19C. Another of the service test models was then also converted for experimental use, becoming the XA-19B, but the other five YA-19s remained as they were. Unfortunately, they did not match the performance of the other attack aircraft that the Air Corps was considering, and in consequence of this, no further orders for the V-11 would eventuate. The five test models were still taken into official service as the A-19, but their time was brief and they never saw combat. Aside from a stint in March Field in California, they would see some service in the Panama Canal Zone, operating as liaison or transport aircraft, though they would be withdrawn from this role before the middle of 1940. The final version of the aircraft was the V-11T. First flown in January 1940, it was a converted V-11A that was to be used as a testbed for Pratt & Whitney. Equipped with a larger rudder and a fixed undercarriage, it was used to test various engines for several years until it was destroyed in an accident on the 20th of March 1945. This meant that, out of all the variants, this final test model probably enjoyed the longest service life, doing what it was actually intended to be used for. 
Unfortunately, no examples of this obscure underdog survive today. Though it never had a glowing record, nor did it cover itself in glory, the Volti V11 was, on the whole, successful. It had no major design flaws that turned it into a death trap, it achieved the requirements of its original military design, though modest, and it was produced in relatively large numbers for an interwar military aircraft. Over 170 were built in the United States, and if you take models produced locally in the Soviet Union and in China into consideration, that number rises to over 220. Considering the Volti V1 was looking to be a dead loss in 1934, this was a remarkable comeback. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patreon supporters, whose names you'll see on the screen here. Now, I apologise for the gap in video production, when I got back from my mini break, some behind the scenes stuff took priority, and I had to get that sorted before our regular content could resume. I've also got a bit of a lingering cough at the moment, which is uh, a bit annoying as well. But, fingers crossed, it should all be back to normal moving forward. A big thank you as well to our Wing Commander tier patrons, and a warm welcome to Reese Glidden and Graham Kidd, who are the newest members of this special group. As always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.